take up Climate Crisis, which is a comedy show about climate change, huh? Yeah. I know, thank me later, darlings. What a brave boy, huh? What a brave little boy doing comedy about climate change. <laughs> we all told him, you're not going to be able to make climate change funny. And to be fair to him, he didn't. But what a brave boy. What a brave little boy, huh? It's been a weird experience writing this show, a comedy show about climate change. Ah! Why is it a comedy show, I hear you ask? The reason it's a comedy show is basically to, 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 to trick you all into coming, right? Because <laughs> <laughs> Ed Fringe asked me to like categorise your show five months before you've even written it. And five months ago, I remember sitting in my bedroom thinking, I can make climate change funny. <laughs> Turns out, no. Very serious topic. I know that now. You should all be ashamed of yourself. No, no, they're turning up here to laugh about climate change. Fucking weirdo. It's been a very weird experience writing the show for a multitude of different reasons. Not least because the week before the fringe, I was in court. Which really sort of fucked with my fringe fans, to be honest with you. I'm really dead, really dead, really dead. <laughs> um, I, I, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm accused of um, uh, criminal damage and aggravated trespass for uh, gluing myself to the, the, the door of a fossil fuel conference. Uh, allegedly, have to say that, don't I? <laughs> Kirsty, isn't that right? Where's Kirsty? Where's, where, where's Kirsty? Hello, Kirsty. Kirsty, one of the lawyers on the case. <laughs> Very nice that Kirsty turned up today. Um, Kirsty, there might be like multiple points in the show where I go, just cover your ears, okay? <laughs> what, like, what is the legal implications of confessing to a crime on stage? Don't do it. Right, okay. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a weird hour. <laughs> really weird uh, process writing this show. Um, basically, the, 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 the court case hasn't actually been concluded yet, it had to be adjourned. They want to adjourn it for like August, right? Which meant that I had to stand up in a criminal court and say, I am so sorry, Your Honour, but I actually have an Edinburgh Fringe show. <laughs> <laughs> so like, if you don't enjoy this show for whatever reason, then you are also complicit in wasting CPS time. Right? <laughs> That's on you, right? It's been an odd experience writing this show for a multitude of different reasons, not least because I think the emotion that we more readily associate with climate change is one of fear, is one of anxiety. And I think it's only responsible of me to admit right at the start of the show, right off the bat, that I am really anxious about this. I am, I'm terrified. I wake up every morning to the sound of my own screams. And I admit that is a weird choice of alarm. <laughs> Start the day as you mean to go on. Fucking terrifying, right? There's been an odd experience for a multitude of, of different reasons, and, and one of those emotions that is valid is, is fear. Uh, but I think it's also important to acknowledge happiness, right? Our propensity for joy, that we can continue to laugh about this. Everything I say in this show is true. For those of you who don't know, I'm one of the people that organised the Extinction Rebellion protests in London this year. Woo! Yeah! Woo! <laughs> this side, loving that. <laughs> This side, all climate denial. <laughs> Split the room, the extinction rebellion way. <laughs> oh, it's going to be a weird gig. Allegedly, Kirsty, it's going to be allegedly. Okay, let's go. Um, it, it, is, it, is, it is a hard thing to talk about on stage, and I think it is really important that we remember to laugh about it. I do. There's this book, right, written by John Christopher, The Death of Grass, where one character turns to another character and he says, All's not lost while we've still got something to laugh at, eh? And that's always stuck with me. Partly because John Christopher died the day after I read the novel. <laughs> and I remember like, sat there thinking, not laughing now. <laughs> yeah. But partly because I do think it's true. We talk about adaptation all the time, adapting to climate change, becoming more resilient. Well, part of that word, becoming more resilient, is remembering to keep on going, is remembering to laugh, is changing the way that we communicate with one another, how we hug our parents at the end of a day. That is really important too. I'm really sorry that this isn't like a conventional comedy show, right? But like, it is something, it is definitely something. Right? <laughs> and I think that's what we need right now. I think we need a panoply of somethings. Good word, panoply. <laughs> I think we need a panoply of somethings because sometimes something is enough. And sometimes something will.
do. Right, I think that's like the sort of preface to the show. Out of the way. Let's begin. Uh, no, it's a very good thing you rang because I've got a problem with my bins. I'm on the phone to Barry in Ipswich. I work in the call centre of a polling company. I took the job because I thought it would allow me to talk about politics. But in reality, it's just listening to other people talking about politics and trying not to scream. <laughs> no, I'm the only bin on the road that does not get collected. For some reason, Barry thinks I work for the council. And I have to keep on telling him I'm a pollster. A what? A pollster. A what? A pollster. Oh, fucking hell, Janet. He says he's from Poland. <laughs> For some reason, I keep on getting through to like racists and sexists, like bigots of all kind, right? He's currently explaining why his bin is the only one on the road that does not get collected. Yes, it's the only bin on the road that says feminists go home on it. Yes, I did. I did myself. Thank you. No. It's called free speech, mate. It's called free speech. I just say it how it is. Remember how we said it how it is, like in the old days? I just call a spade a spade and a woman a spade. <laughs> I hang up and I'm feeling pretty down because a lot of days this is the only human interaction I get. I've just moved to London and I I'm feeling pretty out of it. Like, I'm not really talking to my family. I'm not really seeing my friends. Most days I'm just barely surviving. And now, even that is under threat. I'm sat in my bedroom and I'm reading a report about climate change. I think, like, up until now, I always thought climate change was about, like, polar bears on icebergs, right? Because, like, every article about climate change was this polar bear looking very sad. And I was like, like, no, that is very sad that they're disappearing, right? But if there are that many polar bears looking sad on icebergs, then they can't be disappearing that quick, right? No, it's not that I don't like polar bears. I love polar bears. Or icebergs, for that matter. Big fan of icebergs. Big fan of icebergs. Ever since they killed Leonardo DiCaprio in Titanic. <laughs> Get in. But right now, I've got my own problems. Now, I've been doing some research about climate change and I've decided it's all a hoax. I'm on the phone to Barry again. For some reason, he saved my number in his phone. Now, I've been doing some reading online and I've got two words for you. UN. Yes, I think we know where I'm going with this. <laughs> U-N-S-A-F-E-S-E-X. Unsafe sex. You see, climate change is a hoax perpetuated by deviants who want to disrupt the contraceptive industry by preventing me from wrapping my willy in plastic. Deviants. Now about my puns. <laughs> and I'm reading more about climate change now, more and more reports, more and more books, and what I'm starting to realise is starting to really, really terrify me. Actually, I don't think it is to do with condoms. I'm on the phone to Barry again. We're speaking a lot. It's a little bit unhealthy. <laughs> I think it might be the socialists, the communists and the Hollywood actors who are another group I irrationally hate but so far failed to mention. You see, if we actually tackle climate change, what that would involve is dismantling the entire free market is the end of our economic and political systems as we currently conceive of them. What that would mean is re-centering every policy decision around principles of love and justice and equality and fairness, restructuring our relationship with one another so that we become better, kinder, wiser human beings. It sounds awful. <laughs> and I think for the first time that Barry might actually be onto something. I've been reading this book called This Change is everything by Naomi Klein, right? I've always approached things from quite a left-wing perspective, and I think, to be honest with you, this is the first time that someone's been able to actually articulate the climate crisis for me in a language that I genuinely understand. What's that then? Polish. <laughs> I'm on the phone about it. <laughs> and I'm trying to explain to him why it is that I've just started to care about climate change. I tell him about the indigenous people of Chad in Africa. The indigenous people of Chad rely on the Lake Chad for their livelihood, but 75% of that lake has already disappeared, meaning that this tribe right now, today, is facing the very real decision whether to stay in their ancestral home where they have always lived and to die, or whether to migrate and to face untold tragedy elsewhere. Four climate activists are murdered every single week, and it is indigenous people that are on the front lines of this struggle. They are dying in their hundreds, and we do not even want to talk about it. 
We don't even want to think about it. And so we do nothing. And at the end of this, I realise that I'm crying. And it's the first time that I've actually allowed myself to, 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 to cry about this. So it all comes out in waves of grief and guilt and fear. What? Crying like a girl? I realise Barry's been there the entire time. And this is his reaction. Like, it makes me kind of angry that you can listen to this. The people who are dying now and still actively choose to deny. So I hang up for the final time. I pack up my things. I leave my desk. And I quit my job. So that's how it all started. Well, like for me anyway, right? <laughs> it was a bit weird because the next day I'm like sat in my flat. I don't have a job. I don't have anywhere paying the rent. I'm just sat there with my computer desperately Googling how to solve climate change. <laughs> Nothing's coming up. <laughs> well, like rather things are, but they just don't make any sense. They're things like, oh, sign a petition. Or uh, why don't you donate to your local NGO? Or, or, or why don't you speak to your favourite priest? It's like, that's not going to do anything. Signing a petition about climate change is like being told you're going to die in five days and resolving to eat more grapes. <laughs> Great for you. What we need is system change, right? What we need is a fucking revolution, but I didn't see a revolution happening anywhere. For a while I slipped into doomism. I read Jem Bendel's paper on deep adaptation, a philosopher who right now says that it is already too late, that social collapse is inevitable. And for a while, that is what I believe, that is my reality, because we need a revolution and there isn't a revolution. And then, a week later, I come across a group online called Extinction Rebellion, right? Extinction Rebellion. And these guys are objectively nut jobs, okay? <laughs> I come across them on Twitter and they've got like fewer Twitter followers than my mum. <laughs> The first video is presented by this guy that looks like Gandalf in an anorak. <laughs> but I listen to what he's saying and I realise that I don't disagree with a single word. He says what we need right now is a mass campaign of non-violent peaceful civil disobedience in the rich tradition of the suffragettes and the civil rights movement, of the diggers and the chartists, where ordinary people step up, step into their power and actually do something, actually choose to resist because we are facing an existential emergency and our political class have wholly failed to protect us. And I think this is it, right? This is the motherfucking revolution, baby! The problem is it's mainly based in Bristol. <laughs> so I send like uh, a message on Twitter, right? Like totally speculatively, not thinking anything's gonna come from this, saying, I don't know, guys. <laughs> like if you wanna come to London in the next two or three, like if it's really going well for you, then maybe you can have my living room as a meeting space. And I think nothing more of it. The next day, 10 people turn up at my door. And I don't want to get arrested. I really don't. I've always been a bit of a geek, a bit of a nerd. I've always played by the rules. Like, I've never been in trouble with the police before. I've never even had a detention, right? And now, suddenly, here I am in a room full of people and all of them have criminal records. And who knows how many detentions? I have to keep on reminding myself that intellectually, this is something that I genuinely believe in, so I'm going to give it a chance. We organise our first protest, the Declaration of Rebellion. It's 9am on a Wednesday morning, and I'm totally surprised by the numbers that turn out. A thousand people. People like Clive Lewis, Caroline Lucas. A 15-year-old girl who comes all the way from Sweden in an electric car with her dad. No one really knows who she is at the moment, but she's about to become very, very famous. All as one, we walk into the road and we sit down and I feel like a little kid again. Like, this is something naughty, like, this energy that the climate movement is suddenly being given, gifted, is something new, something that's not going away, right? That in this moment, we are totally and utterly unstoppable. Three hours later and we decide to stop, right? No, you have to at some point. <laughs> And this little old woman comes up to me. She knows I'm one of the organisers because we've got high vis on with like a skull and crossbones on the back. <laughs> it's a little bit too cool for me, like a little bit too punk, right? I'm feeling very awkward about the whole thing. And she comes over and she gives me this most amazing hug and she says, Thank you for doing what you are doing. We need people like you right now. And I can feel this sense of responsibility 
I can feel the hope that she's already invested in these thousand people in Parliament Square pressing through into me. And I resolve then and there that I'm not going back to my job. I've made a little bit of money from acting now and I don't want to save anymore. I don't want to save on a dead planet, right? This is the most important social justice struggle of our generation. No, this is the most important social justice struggle of our lives. And I personally am going to do everything I possibly can to resist. Well, apart from get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so, who wants to get arrested? My friend Lucy is giving a training on non-violent direct action. We train all our activists in non-violent direct action. And she's currently explaining how to go let's floppy when a policeman tries to arrest you. It's supposed to make it harder to arrest, but in reality it just makes us look really silly. <laughs> <laughs> We're not working from my flat anymore. We've got an office in Westminster. And it feels like the whole world is there. Like at one point, I'm on a team of two people that have just quit that 100,000 pound jobs at big tech companies and two people who come here in between meetings at the job centre. People from all across the world too. There's a man from West Papua, a woman from Bangladesh. Someone comes all the way from America. Oh my god, you guys, you're so fucking real. Can I say that? Can I say you're so real? Oh my god, I love you. Can I say that? Oh my fucking god, I love you. Can I swear? I'm swearing a lot. Oh my fucking god, can I tweet about you? Okay, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting. I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting, I'm tweeting. <laughs> You've got to like, we're going a viral in America, baby! <laughs> and we were, we were spreading from country to country. This was flowing with an energy that none of us quite actually understood. I meet a man from France. Hello! Oh, as we say in France, bonjour. My name is Gilet Jean. My name is Gilet Jean. My name is Jean. And I wear some very nice gilets. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the gilets jaunes are this like environmentalist movement in France, right? That can basically be characterised into three main factions. Environmentalists, angry drivers, and people who just like setting fire to things. <laughs> and I don't know which one he is. Like, I think we can say this, right? Because we're all friends here. Um, but like, I'm pretty sure he's a sadomasochist. Right? No, I am. I'm pretty sure. At one point, I go to his flat and he's got the word pain written on his bread bin. <laughs> oh, Sam. I can tell you are the creme de la creme. Or, as we say in France, the cream of uh, the cream, I guess. I want to know, are you prepared to get arrested? There's a question I've been asked a lot in recent months and I don't really know the answer and just then my dad calls me. Hi Sam, I've been doing some reading about this Extinction Rebellion thing and I'm really very worried. Sorry dad, I don't have time to talk right now. Can I call you back later? And I hang up. The next day, and we shut down the Department for Business in London, is the first time that I see activists super glue themselves to a door. And I think, wow, get a load of these fucking weirdos. <laughs> and just then my dad calls me. Hey Sam, um, I'm really very worried about you getting a criminal record because it could majorly affect your life chances. Sorry dad, I don't have time to talk right now. Can I call you back later? And I hang up. The next day, and we shut down five bridges in central London, and it feels amazing because this is the first time that we're actually dominating the news cycle. I give interviews to the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian. For some reason, I'm featured in Vogue. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, who's a model, calls me and is like, Sam, babe, you in Vogue? No, stop it, you before me, stop it, no. Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so, Sam. How do I join? <laughs> and people are joining all of the time. This movement is getting bigger and bigger. A week later I'm in Buckingham Palace and my mate Gail is reading out a letter to the Queen and just then my dad calls me. Hi Sam, um, I'm just reading Vogue and I am very worried. <laughs> Sorry Dad, I don't have time to talk right now. Can I call you back later? And I hang up. The young people of the movement lead us back to Parliament Square and it feels like something different is happening. Like the young people of this movement are finally ready to lead. Like they're stepping up into their power and saying we are here, we are loud, we are brilliant and we are beautiful. That the people who are missing from the previous actions, the youth of London, are here and they are here in force. And just then the police turn up and they start to make arrests. And I'm faced with the very real decision for the very first time. Do I stay here with my friends or do I step out and avoid getting arrested? It's a split second decision. I don't really have time to think. I don't know what I'm doing, but I step out. And I try to slink away. 
but somebody sees me. Hey, Sam, where are you going? It's John, <laughs> wearing a very nice gilet today. <laughs> what are you doing? Why are you not getting arrested? I don't know, my dad. Your dad? Yeah, my dad. Your dad does not love you, huh? No, my dad loves... No, your dad does not appreciate you. He does not love you. He does not understand what are you doing, huh? He is a fake father. <laughs> he is a fake father. He is a fake father. <laughs> As we say in France, a faux pas. <laughs> I'm on the bus home and I'm feeling pretty down and I don't really know what I'm doing when my dad calls me. I pull out my phone, I look at the screen and I decline the call. It was all being a part of Extinction Rebellion at the start because basically like everybody hated us. <laughs> like the press, the police, the right, the left. And like actually in the early days a lot of those critiques were entirely legitimate. The problem was like no one else had any better ideas apart from like mouthing off on Twitter or like uh, gesticulating in a TV studio, right? I think we had the opposite problem. We were doing a protest every single day and I was beginning to get incredibly uh, emotionally and physically exhausted. I'd never even like come across the word burnout before but now I was using it every single day. It's one of those like old ironies of climate activism, right? Then fighting for a more sustainable world, you're inadvertently forced to live this totally unsustainable way of life. People come up to you and they're like, hey, do you want to organise a protest? And you're like, oh, no, I'd love to, but I'm just, I'm so busy and tired and like, I don't really, I can't do it, I'm so sorry, no. And they're like, oh, no, I totally get, that's so important, don't worry, man, that's fine, that's totally cool, don't worry, I understand. It's just it is for the future of all mankind. <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly you're organising a protest. A week after the Bridges protest, and my friend Fahana says, do you want to come to the UN conference on climate change? And maybe out of duty, maybe out of obligation, I say yes. The next day, and I find out that it's in Poland. <laughs> Fucking Poland. So I'm trying to like organise train tickets to Poland. Trains to Poland! Which would be great if there were any trains to Poland. <laughs> Actually like a word here about personal choice and system change. I think there's this like false dichotomy, particularly on the left, right? That exists between personal change and system change. It's like a prevailing myth that says because the climate crisis is systemic solutions, which is true, that we don't have to talk at all about how we're ordering our own personal lives now, the decisions that we're making now, how we are existing, living right now, here today, and basically that, as an intellectual thesis, is bollocks, right? It's a bit like saying the patriarchy is a structural problem and it's going to require structural solutions, <laughs> so in the meantime I'm going to continue to kick my wife. <laughs> <laughs> we all have to be out there demanding something bigger, protesting, putting our bodies on the line, demanding system change, demanding that as a society we dream of something bigger, that we dream of utopia. But at the same time, none of that, like, it's just totally meaningless if we're not doing that deep personal work within ourselves, if we're not changing the way that we talk to strangers. If we're not changing the way that we talk to our family and our friends, if we're not like changing the way that we're living right now, and like actually that does mean giving some things up, right? That does mean switching to a plant-based diet. Like that does mean less flying. I'm really sorry, but it does. It means putting down your foot and saying there is absolutely no way. There is absolutely no way that I'm going to fly to the climate change conference in Poland. So we're on a mega bus to Poland and it's not going to be sick and a paper bag and the toilets smell like shit. I think the only thing that's getting me through is this sort of like vague sense of moral superiority. <laughs> Which for those of you who are wondering is a form of renewable energy. <laughs> We get to Poland and the streets are lined with policemen. Huge policemen with huge machine guns and ammo that run down to their toes. The conference centre, huge walls, barbed wire fences, more and more policemen, more and more guns. Now the climate change conference is being sponsored by a coal company. <gasps> Let me say that again. The climate change conference is being sponsored by a coal company. Which means when me and my friends arrive at the conference and hand over like our ID, they hand us this goodie bag of petroleum-based products. Now here's a petroleum based scarf, here's a petroleum based phone case. At one point a woman walks past us with a platter of cured meats. It's fucking bizarre, right? <laughs> 
And this is where power is. This is where they make the big decisions, so this is where we have to be. The first person that we bumped into is an indigenous leader from Africa. And as she turns round, I instantly recognise her. She's from the same tribe that I was reading about just a couple of months ago. And I want to run over to her, I want to say that you're the reason I'm here, that your story, your struggle, the way that you're leading this movement is the reason I'm here. That the reason I just took a two-day fucking megabus to Poland is because of you. But when she turns round, I realise that's not appropriate at the moment. Because she's crying. And the reason that she is crying is because for the entire day she has been forced to debate on the floor of the UN whether to note or to welcome the latest IPCC report. This is the IPCC report on 1.5 degrees warming. The report that this conference commissioned and is now debating whether to even acknowledge that it exists. And she looks at me and my friends with these tears in her eyes that I don't think I will ever forget. She says 1.5 degrees of warming is a death sentence for me and my people. 1.5 degrees of warming means that we'd all die. It means that my brother dies. It means that my sister dies. It means that our children will all die. 1.5 degrees of warming is a death sentence for me and my people and I am being forced to stand here in Poland and debate whether we can even acknowledge the science that tells us that. We go back to the flat that we're staying in that night full of fear, full of intrepidation. I don't really know what to expect. I'm staying on this like sofa bed, right? And I think two days of megabus travel has really fucked my back. And now all I can think is like, oh, poor me. It's so sad for me. Poor me. I'm so sorry for me. <laughs> the next day at the conference, nothing really happens. And the next day, the same thing. And the next day, the same thing. It turns out that a lot of the bigger, richer, wealthier countries, as is so often the case, are trying to water down more ambitious climate policy. And on the fifth day, we decide that we're going to hold a press conference to inject a little bit of energy into this debate. The star speaker is 15-year-old Greta Thunberg, who came to our very first action and comes back now to talk at the UN. Our second speaker is President Nasheed of the Maldives. The Maldives is an island nation quickly disappearing underwater where the graveyards are quite literally right now floating away. And he stands up in the UN and he declares a rebellion against extinction. He's wearing our badge and his lapel and his aids keep on trying to take it off him. <laughs> and he says no. I trust them. I trust them. And for a moment I have that feeling again, that feeling that I first had with the little old woman in Parliament Square. That sense of responsibility, of hope. Only this time it's the leader of a nation. <laughs> I don't really have the time to compute this because just then my back gives out and I'm rushed to Polish A&E. <laughs> I don't know what's happening, I don't speak Polish and they just keep on speaking in Polish and I'm like, oh yeah, very fine. And then totally unannounced, the Polish doctor pulls out this giant syringe and injects me up the arse with pain here. <laughs> and I think, what would Barry and Ipswich think of <laughs> 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 I don't really have time to process the surreality of it because the, just then my friend Tamsin calls me and they say that they've disrupted uh, Claire Perry, the business secretary's speech on the floor of the UN and at the end of it her aides have invited us to meet with them and they want me at this meeting. So maybe out of duty, maybe out of obligation. I wean myself off the bed in Polish a &E. I struggle across the conference floor and we find this tiny little room tucked away at the back of the conference. Inexplicably, the meeting is being chaired by the deputy leader of the World Bank. <laughs> <laughs> she, she's just sat there like, hello, I'm the deputy leader of the World Bank. I hear you're in open rebellion against the UK government. So I'm just here to make sure nothing untoward happens. <laughs> I don't know what she thinks we're gonna do. Like at this point, the drugs have worked so effectively that I can't even move my feet. Let alone staple myself to the desk, right? <laughs> Claire Perry starts speaking. And she says that we are doing enough, that the UK is doing enough, that we are leading climate policy internationally, that we are being ambitious enough, that we will continue to pursue the same policies that we have already pursued because it is doing enough. 
And then she stops speaking. And it's her turn to speak. And I don't remember like exactly what we said, because I was very hazy at the time. <laughs> but I remember that we spoke about Hindu, the indigenous leader that we bumped into on the very first day. We told Claire Perry that 1.5 degrees of warming would kill her and her people. That the way we have currently structured our world, our economy, is killing people right now in the global south. And that we have a moral and political duty to do something about it. To tear down the systems that need to be torn down. To reimagine what needs to be reimagined. Because people are dying right now and we have a duty to do something. And I remember we stopped speaking and she starts to laugh. And I don't know, maybe it was all the drugs up my ass. <laughs> but when she started to laugh at us, I started to cry. The struggle for climate justice is the same struggle for racial equality. It is the same struggle for economic and social emancipation, because climate change isn't going to happen quickly, right? It's not going to happen like it does in the movies, like a disease that tears through the world in a day. Climate change is happening now. Climate change is slow. Climate change is terrible. Climate change is brutal. Climate change is coming for some groups faster than it is coming for others. Climate change is going to kill some people sooner than it kills others. Climate change is the slippery slope on the way to hell. Climate change is Boris Johnson. Climate change is Donald <laughs> Trump. Climate change is racist immigration policy and the hostile environment. Climate change is border guard and detention centers. Climate change is benefit cuts and broken promises. Climate change is inequality. Climate change is austerity. Climate change is strike after strike after strike. Climate change is rioting. Climate change is mass death. Climate change is mass suicide. Climate change is mass starvation. Climate change is not having enough food to put on the table. Climate change is death after death after death after death. Climate change is the apocalypse in slow motion. So I'm feeling very positive after my trip to Poland. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think what it's taught me is that our global elites genuinely don't have the solution to this crisis. And that's something that like, I hold my hand up and I admit I've always said rhetorically, but I don't think I've always believed in, right? I don't think I've always thought it was as simple as that. I thought I was like more intelligent, that it was probably more nuanced, but I could present it like this. And now I've been there and I've seen it and it is that black and white, like it is that simple and that is what terrifies me. Because we don't have time to fuck about with reformism anymore. We don't have time to fuck about with technological fixes because people are dying right now. And we have a moral and political duty to resist. So a week after I get back from Poland, I resolve for the very first time that I am prepared to get arrested. So it all starts with an email, right? There's this point in Extinction Rebellion where I'm getting like all the emails we ever get directly into my inbox, <laughs> which is a lot of emails. <laughs> and they're all things like, I don't agree with you, I don't like you, goodbye. <laughs> I got one the other day actually, it was just like, the subject line was all caps locks, just this, it was just, you eco-Nazi whore! Just that. <laughs> you eco-Nazi whore! I'm sure that's like a whore who also happens to be an eco-Nazi. Or whether it's like a whore who has a sexual preference for eco-Nazis. <laughs> Either way, my new Tinder bio. <laughs> All the cat shots be true to the original. <laughs> the body of the email, right, was just one sentence. It was just this. It was just... You're never going to take my burger away from me. Just that. You're never going to take my burger away. But that is a weird thing to say. What? Because that is an objectively weird thing to say in whatever scenario. And two, because a burger is a perishable item. And like, I like to imagine there's some man in like Arizona walking around with a little burger. Like, this is my burger. I've had it for 
for 20, 30 years and no one's going to take it away from me. And yes, it is now a decaying pile of mold in my hands. But that's the American dream. Baby. I get an email that says I've got an idea for a protest, which is normally a very bad sign. Right? Like, protests I've had suggested to me in the past via email include gluing myself to the Queen's face. Like, literally do that. <laughs> And then setting myself on fire. <laughs> Self-immolation? Question mark. That one came with an explanation. It was like, oh, it's, it's all a metaphor for climate change. Like, no way! <laughs> Congratulations on your GCSE art project. <laughs> Shame I die. <laughs> says I've got an idea for a protest and this one actually sounds kind of sane. It tells me about an event that's happening called International Petroleum Week. A congregation of big fossil fuel companies that descend upon London to sign multi-million pound contracts. And I look at the programme and what I see starts to enrage me. It talks about growth of fossil fuels. Let's be totally and utterly clear. We already have enough reserves to burn the world four times over. And these companies right now today are looking for more reserves. There's no other reason than the profit motive, right? That kind of behaviour, that's not just illogical, that's genuinely fucking pathological. And it should be against the law. And I'm getting more and more angry and then I see something that hits me emotionally. And it's this event which talks about new opportunities for coal in Africa. And suddenly I'm back there in Poland again with Hindu and she's telling us that 1.5 degrees of warming is a death sentence for her and her people. That 1.5 degrees of warming wipes her out, wipes her tribe out, those generations of knowledge and stories and wisdom and medicine and way of life that it all ends with 1.5 degrees of warming. The fossil fuel industry is currently planning for four to five degrees of warming. Warming on that scale means the death and displacement of hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people. That's not me being alarmist, that's literally what it says in the IPCC report, right? That's the conservative estimate, hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people. And someone needs to do something about this. Someone needs to do something, so like an hour later and I'm organising a protest. I'm on the phone to this Buddhist monk who now lives in Totnes but comes from New Zealand. And he's all right, Sam, this is a really good idea, I love this. Um, I'm going to be in London, I'm going to not take my phone because I don't want to get arrested with my phone. So I'm going to meet you tomorrow morning at 7am in the pret a -Manger. Okay, bye. <laughs> and now like, I'm actually organising this protest, allegedly Kirsty. <laughs> And I don't really know what I'm, 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 I'm doing. I've never done this part of it before. So I go to the hotel where the conference is happening and I start taking pictures of the exits and entrances because like, that's what they do in the moon things, right? And at one point someone comes up to me and is like, uh, what are you doing? And I say, oh, just, just taking pictures of the exits for my school project at hotels. <laughs> How to break it to them. <laughs> By this point I've got a whole team, I've got a welfare team, legal observers, I've got other people who are prepared to get arrested with me. At midnight one of them phones me up and says, so Sam, what's the actual plan? And I realise I don't have one. Mm. <laughs> then I remember, a couple of months ago, seeing some activists glue themselves to the front of the Department for Business. And I thought, what fucking weirdos, and right now I think, that'll do. <laughs> so I Google where to buy superglue at this time of night. There's only one place open in London, and I go there and I buy nine individual tiny little pots of superglue. <laughs> the man on the checkout looks at me really strangely. <laughs> He's like, you know you could just buy one big pot of superglue. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, they're not actually all for me, they're, um, they're actually for my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Allegedly, Kirsty. And at 3 in the morning, I'm in bed, and at 7am, I'm in the pret and the Buddhist monk is there, and he's like, alright, this is so fucking exciting. <laughs> and it all feels kind of real. 
I start walking towards the hotel, I break into a run, I get the super glue, put it on my hand and stick myself to the door. And I know this feels kind of small, kind of insignificant, kind of tiny in the moment, but right then I feel like I'm on top of the world, like I'm actually doing something. All the depression, the anxiety that I've been experiencing in recent months because of the climate suddenly dissipates. Because right now I'm actually doing what I believe in. I'm not just talking about it anymore, I'm taking action. And this feels right. And then the police turn up and I start to get very frightened. <laughs> they tell me that a glue disposal unit is on the way. I don't know what that is. <laughs> like you can sort of like melt through super glue with like nail varnish, right? So in reality, I imagine it was like a community support officer going to super drug. <laughs> but in the moment, I'm terrified. I come unstuck and they bundle me into the back of a police van. I get to the police station, they do my photographs, they do my fingerprints. There. The guy doing my fingerprints doesn't realise that I've been arrested for gluing my hand to a building. <laughs> so, so he keeps on going... <laughs> Simon! <laughs> it's like half his hand doesn't even exist. <laughs> I'm going to a police cell and it's incredibly hard to stay. I don't know whether anyone's been in a cell before, but you basically have a toilet, a mattress, and a bell that you ring, and they have to come. It's like room service in a really shit hotel, right? <laughs> and I ring it, and the great slides open. What do you want? Um, I I'd like a book. I know I'm entitled to a book. I'd really like a book. Right. Yeah. I know you're entitled to a book. It's just no one's actually ever asked for a book. <laughs> Genuinely, ten minutes later, he comes back with the only two books that the police station owns. Right, so I've got Stormbreaker by Anthony Horowitz. <laughs> or I've got a shit book on mountaineering. I go for the book that he describes as a shit book on mountaineering. It's called The Beckoning Silence, which becomes a sort of metaphor for my time in the cell. It's one of these like shit books about mountaineering, which is like a daring do tale of adventure. And the daring day, like tale of adventure in this one is that basically they're trying to climb the ice caps, but they keep on melting. And it's like the world's fucking laughing at me, right? <laughs> I start to go more and more mental in the cell. I ding the bell again. I say, I'd like a phone call. I know I'm entitled to a phone call. I ring my dad and instantly I regret it. <laughs> I can feel the fear in his voice. He's more upset than I've ever heard him before. He's angry. He's, um, he's disappointed, actually. And I tried to explain to him that this is what I wanted, that I knew what I was doing, that I only really called him because I was sort of bored in the cell. <laughs> I'm told to hang up two minutes later, and as I hang up in his voice, I can still hear that crushing sense of disappointment. And I realise I've let him down. 16 hours later, at 3am in the morning, I'm finally released. I don't have anywhere to go, my phone's not working, my wallet isn't there, I'm down, I'm, I'm, I'm defeated, I'm so, so tired. I get out of the police station and I hear a noise. It's a cheer. And my friends in Extinction Rebellion have waited for me. 16 hours until 3 a.m. the next morning outside the police station with carrots and hummus <laughs> and water and I fall into their arms and I start to cry. I realise there's a lot of crying in the show. <laughs> I realise that like halfway through writing it. I, I don't really know why. I never used to be an emotional person. Um, I, I, I cry quite a lot now. I cry like every week. And I'm going to level with you. It's not always about climate change. <laughs> <laughs> but I think there is something about confronting this issue, about grappling with the truth of it every day that does force you to become more emotional as a human being. I'm really grateful for the way that it's changed me. But I think it has made me much more emotional. And right now, I'm feeling more down than I've ever felt before. Just done this action with eight other people, nine people, that's not a fucking movement, is it? People come in and out the whole time, the conference isn't disrupted in any way. What's the point? 
I got arrested for what? Genuinely for what? Like, just because some fuckers come up with some stupid theory about arrests and social change and I just bought it because I wanted to, not because I actually believe it, but because I wanted to, right? Because I needed hope. Because that's all I ever wanted, just hope. And now I am broken, I am tired, I am exhausted, and I don't have that anymore. And I just want it to be like how it was before. But I just want to see my friends, I just want to speak to my family normally, I just want a normal job. I just want to talk to Barry and Ipswich about his fucking bins. I don't want to have to do this, right? But I just want to be young again, because I love my friends in the Kingdom Rebellion. They are all the most beautiful human beings I have ever met in my life. But I just want to be allowed to be young again. I just want to go to the pub and get drunk and behave like a twat to be young, right? Instead of this, instead of having to do this, and I feel like I do have to do this. I'm so tired. I'm so, so exhausted. I feel like I'm, like, inside of me, like, like some, so something is breaking all of, all of the time. I don't, I don't want to feel like that anymore. So, I want to walk away, like, I want to quit, I want to step back, because I need to step back. But I promised myself, my tired, exhausted self. But before I quit, one final push. All right, so it's the April Rebellion. We're gonna be shutting down bridges in Belgium. In America, we're gonna be fucking up the fossil fuel industry. In Ghana, we're gonna be walking down the street blowing whistles to sound the climate alarm. And in London, we're gonna be shutting down five central locations. It's gonna be fucking epic, me. And it is epic. It feels like that energy that we first experienced in Parliament Square is back again. It feels like that is just emerging, that people are coming out of everywhere and they've got ideas. Suddenly ideas everywhere and the decentralised way that we work means that we just welcome them and move on. I meet a man from Glasgow, alright? I'm very prepared for this. I've got myself a tent. I've got myself a sleeping bag. I've got myself 42. Adult diapers, <laughs> just in case I want to climb a tree and not get down. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly, people emerging from everywhere, and it's brilliant. We're just welcoming it, welcoming that energy. And at 9 a.m. on the first day, I get to Parliament Square, and this time there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people there. And this feels like a movement. My mate Jamie's on the megaphone from the old Occupy movement and he's saying, ladies and fucking gentlemen, I think this is perhaps the biggest privilege in my life when I say welcome to the motherfucking rebellion. And the crowds go wild and we're using the space responsibly. We are, we're talking about politics and economics and what happens next, what needs to come next. And in the night we have our first test because the police don't arrest us in the day, but in the night they come like vampires. <laughs> <laughs> and amazingly, that night, all five spaces are held. And the next night, the same thing. And the next night, the same thing. And we are dominating the news cycle and our message is finally cutting through. We want the government to declare a climate emergency. We want the government to declare a climate emergency and it feels right. Like it feels that success is right now on the cards. But instead of waste that, we decide to leave on our own terms. Ten days later, we leave on our own terms. A decision that is made by every single rebel out on the streets. And amazingly, the next day, we're invited to meet with politicians. I'm coordinating our political strategy with my friend Fahana, the person who invent, uh, invited me to Poland. And we stay up every night writing briefing notes to 3 a.m., 4 a.m. We meet with Sadiq Khan, we meet with John McDonnell, and then we meet with Michael Gove. This like pantomime villain from my childhood. <laughs> and I want to say something, I want to shout or scream or laugh or something, but I can't because it's all being live streamed and we have to look very serious. <laughs> we want the government to declare a climate emergency. <clears throat> 
We want the government to declare a climate emergency, and he says no. But then, the very next day, the Labour Party table a bill to declare a climate emergency in Parliament. And totally out of the blue, the Conservatives abstain. <coughs> meaning that the UK becomes the first country in the entire world to declare a climate emergency. So there we go. We won, I guess, like we won, right? <laughs> we caused the government to declare a climate emergency. And in doing so, like, even though that is tiny and tokenistic, I think this movement, this energy is saving lives. I know that's a really big thing to say. I know, I know it's really big. But I think it is. I think this energy that we are privileged enough to be one articulation of, we don't own it. We're an articulation of this energy that is mirrored in the school strikes across Europe, in the Sunrise Movement in America. And that energy is going to continue changing the world. This is a movement led by indigenous people, led by women, led by people of colour, led by those in the global south, led by young people. And this movement is totally and utterly unstoppable. I did think about trying to make this neater at the end. Like, I don't know, like having Barry and Ipswich come back. <laughs> be like, I believe in climate change now. <laughs> but like up his tree in an adult diaper. Right? <laughs> I don't know, like, I did try that and it didn't really work. Everything I said in this show has been true. And, um, and it didn't seem very true because the truth is that what happens next, how the story ends, how it continues, is not up to like, somebody speaking to loads of people in a darkened room, it's up to all of us, right? Like the way I see it is that we have two futures. We have one future in which wildfires continue to tear through this world with wild abandon, where sea levels continue to rise, where ice caps continue to melt, where multinational corporations continue to desecrate our lands and disembowel our earth where governments continue their policies of inaction, of criminal negligence. This is a future that we're seeing right now. Right now, today in Brazil, with the fires that are raging, this is a future that ends in fascism. I think that's the future that we're heading for. I did, I do. But I think there's another future too. I think there is a better future, a kinder future, a coming day, and perhaps we remember what it is that we need, what it is that we value, who it is that we love, and why it is that love is important. In which we can be brave, right? In which we can stand up and resist, in which we can say we need to tear down the structures that need to be torn down. That we need to rewild the imagination in order to rewild the earth, that we have got a lot of work to do. <coughs> And it could be better than that. I think that future is possible. I do. I do. But it's very distant to me a lot of the time. And I have to force myself to remember it. I have to force myself to remember the bridges that we shut down and the buildings that we blocked and the hands glued to doors. Because that's what gives me hope. And we all find hope in different places, right? Everything I said in this show is true. Apart from maybe that the climate change movement is unstoppable. I really need to stop right now. I'm really tired. I'm really, really tired. And I've still got this court case hanging over me and I don't really know what I'm doing or what I can do next. And a lot of us are feeling really tired right now. I know we are. We are feeling so tired and we need help. Because nobody's coming to save you, right? What we need now is ordinary people to step into their power and do something. Extinction Rebellion was started with way fewer people than this in a room that realised that where power lies is in ordinary people standing up and doing something. And I think that's what we need right now. We need a panoply of something. Because sometimes something is enough, and sometimes something will do. So I ask every single one of you, what is your something? 
What are you going to do? Anyway, I told you it was a weird comedy show. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs>